actually it came from when we were doing the TV pilot uh, four years ago, I think. I mm. knocked up a, a two-pronged dining fork, old sort of medieval-style dining fork for the feast that we had. And uh, I think those kind of sat glaring at me for a couple of years thinking, you know, what can we do with that to turn it into a, into a viable product, something we can put onto the website. Um, and then Joe and I were doing cutlery sets, the camping cutlery set last Christmas. So we had the knife, the fork and the spoon um, in, the, in a canvas roll. Um, then we just did, I think the, it just got bigger. This got bigger and bigger. That was, I mean, there's no other way to explain it, really. <laughs> we just wanted something bigger. So it is literally a kind of scaled up version of the, um, the table knife and fork, the cutlery set that we were doing. Um, and it kind of fused with the barbecue set. So we do the barbecue fork and the tongs and the spatulas and all that stuff. And it was kind of a fusion. It sits somewhere, weirdly enough, kind of between the table and the barbecue something you can use for cooking with so the fork's great it's fantastic for turning meat mm. uh, and then you can kind of bring the whole lot to the table and then you can use the knife and fork as a carving set and it was just a really nice kind of marriage of the two any fork is pretty difficult to make um, because you need to get the tines really really nice and even so um, you know, basically once you've forged out, you do your initial heat, your initial forging, and then we split down the middle. Um, and you've got to get that split really, really even. We actually cut it with a, a disc cutter. Traditionally, they're cut with a, with a hot cut. Um, the, the dangers, not quite the right word, but the kind of difficulties are the same. If you're cutting with a hot cutter or with a disc, you have to get it really, really nice and straight. You've got to get equal material on each side. If you don't get equal material, you get one really long tine and one really short one, or one thin one and one fat one, or they're off-center. So, you know, overall, it's a relatively easy piece of forging, but it's very difficult to get them exactly right, to get them looking really, really nice and clean. I've never forged with three time forks, to be honest. Mm. They're much more difficult. So partly we forge two because they're a little bit easier, but also I, I love that kind of medieval look to it. Um, and this, this one being a carving fork, um, you know, you've got to have a certain amount of length and a certain amount of sort of sturdiness, or a certain amount of strength in the tines. If you can imagine you're going into a big joint um, you've got to be able to, or a chicken, you've got to be able to kind of hold it down. It's, it's no good if it's too long or if it's too short. So the proportions of these are, um, are, are you know, very important to get right. One of the kind of challenges to a certain degree is that we make the forks out of stainless steel. Now it's not necessarily more difficult to forge than normal steel, but it is uh, a different type of material, so you need to have a slightly different mindset when you're approaching it. It does forge differently, especially when you're forging out the tines and when you're cutting, splitting things. Um, you definitely have to kind of remember what material you're working with. So, forged stainless. Um, we get that lovely black finish, but because it's an eating tool, it doesn't go rusty. Or we don't want it to go rusty anyway. Actually, the interesting thing about these forks, and what I really, really love about them, is that the, the final shape, that beautiful U shape, a slightly tapered U with the neck, and, the, and where it joins, where the tines 
join the neck uh, and the handle with the fork itself, that shape is actually caused by forging in behind where that U shape is. If you don't do that, you get this very clumpy kind of rigid shape. And uh, especially forging out on the power hammer, you can get in just in behind where the tires are. And it actually flares them out. And that's how you get that really, really nice, beautiful shape. Um, and the, the, the original fork came out of, um, weird enough, reading a book by a, a, a writer called B. Wilson, which is called Consider the Fork. And B. Wilson writes this book all about cutlery and the history of cutlery. And yeah. I, I found this book a couple of years ago and it absolutely fascinates me. The history and the evolution of cutlery. And, you know, we're so used nowadays to having a, a fork w with any meal. Uh, but actually, traditionally, you wouldn't have had forks. You would have had a chunk of bread. Well, originally, you just would have eaten with your hands. And uh, then the kind of, you know, you moved to having a trencher, which is like a bread plate, which you would have used. And I'm not quite sure whether they would eat the plates or whether it was just baked and you'd eat off it. You'd always take a knife with you to dinner, which is classic. If you turn up for dinner nowadays with a knife, I think <laughs> your host would probably ask you to, uh, to leave it at the door. So certainly in medieval times, um, you would have gone to dinner, you would have had a hunting knife that probably would have acted as an eating knife as well, and you would have used your hand with a chunk of bread. And I think from what I've read and from what I've kind of looked into during the Renaissance in, in Italy, and I think in Florence, but I, I might not be 100% correct, that um, they, they stopped people bringing knives to dinner, mostly because you've got this fantastic combination of generally men, knives, and alcohol. <laughs> and you can throw a lot of meat in there, and you're gonna end up with a fight, basically. Yeah. I'm afraid there's not too many ways to look at it. <laughs> and, um, and I think there was kind of, there was a general consensus that in the Renaissance things should be a little bit more refined. So they stopped people bringing knives, and then you would have had a knife laid for you at the table. And that's how the kind of blunt-ended knife was developed, so you've ra you had these rounded off knives to stop you stabbing your neighbour. And I think you would have had maybe a single spike, but definitely a two-pronged fork was the was the initial thing that came with your you know with your knife. So that's where the kind of birth of the knife and the fork. Um, I, I, just kind of, I suppose going back a bit, you would have had wooden spoons, so you probably yeah. would have had a spoon and a knife, you know, and this is all, uh, you know, it's all kind of development of the cutlery. And I just thought it was a fantastic idea to kind of you know, recreate that, um, you know, food of the past was mostly, especially in the West, was kind of root vegetables and meat yeah. and bread. In fact, all the things that we love. <laughs> and cheese. Lots of cheese. Uh, none of which matters if you just, you basically stab the food and you eat it, you know, or you can eat it with your hands. Uh, it's only more recently, kind of more refined food and sort of through the French traditions of dining, fine dining, that you've got three prongs and then now modern, sort of more like four prongs. Um, but being blacksmiths and, you know, we'd, we'd kind of had this idea for a big feast. In other words, what do you want with a feast? You want something that's kind of feast-like, you know, something that fits in with a kind of feast style. It wasn't, a, you know, the, the programme we were making wasn't about fine dining. But so we had these, um, we all had these forks. 
And I just kind of went from there. Then I thought, well, let's make some knives. But making a, a, a kind of a traditional knife with a wooden handle and bolsters and, you know, ground blades and all, all this kind of thing, and they're expensive. So they take a lot of time to make and they are, um, they're expensive to produce and they look beautiful. But the concept of the single piece steak knife was born. And it is just a single piece of high carbon steel forged out metal blade, metal handle, simplicity in itself. But in a previous film we've shown how the sort of Scandinavian style blacksmith knife is made and these are pretty much the same techniques but it's a, it's a kind of a, a maybe a more refined type of knife, much easier for eating with mm. um, and the original set we like I said we produced this camping set sort of gift set like a um, knife fork and spoon and a canvas roll that you would have chucked in your backpack and you can take it you know out anywhere and if you're out camping or whatever um, and that concept has just sort of evolved into the carving set it's like a matching set for the cut right? It's more of a purposeful knife as opposed to the, the traditional blacksmith knife that's a bit more of a kind of, it'll do pretty much anything. That's very much got a, a specific purpose. Yeah, I think this is a, a single purpose knife. It's definitely an eating tool. It's an eating knife. The traditional blacksmith's knives could have been used for eating, but they are also used for cutting string and you know, fruit and whatever and gutting pigeons. And, all sorts, all of which you could do with one of these, but this is just a sort of a more refined version. Mm. Um, and it's quite nice if you've got, if you know, you're laying a table setting and, you, uh, and you're doing a lot of fire cooking, it's quite nice in the sense that the sort of theme flows all the way through. So it is just a sort of, it's a slightly um, scaled up and a larger version of the cutlery. Um, and the, the full steel carving knife is lovely. It's lovely to use. It's really simple. You don't really worry about if you're getting meat juice on it. It's easy to clean. We're aiming for an underground blade. So it, the whole thing has forge texture on it. Uh, and we're forging the bevels right, right down to almost a cutting edge, not quite, obviously you've got to grind the edge, but they're forged right out. Um, so the, all we have to do is put a very, very small, it's probably about I don't know, three quarters of a millimeter secondary grind after it's been hardened and tempered, you put this very fine secondary bevel on it and it gives this lovely kind of completely forged feel and look to it. Um, so it is quite different from how we would make other blades where, where you forge it out, you leave a little bit of thickness along the edge and then you grind in the bevels. Mm -hmm. And I think it looks gorgeous. It yeah. gives a really, really nice kind of rustic sort of in inverted commas medieval look but would sit quite nicely in a modern restaurant Cabrito is a company that's founded on the idea of the dairy the dairy system in the UK has a hundred thousand milking nannies they probably have around 60 to 70,000 male kids a year born and up until we came along in the overwhelming majority of cases those animals were euthanized and we me and my partner Sushi who set the business up together just thought that was indefensible yeah. morally ethically indefensible um, and also a tremendous waste of what is uh, meat that is popular all over the world I mean, yeah. The rest of the world knows goat meat is delicious mm. it's only the UK that really sticks out like a sore thumb so we thought we could we had a sort of 
a reasonable restaurant trade in the UK. We thought maybe we could take Goatober and we could maybe do an event and then maybe get some people to put some goat on the menu and tweet about it a little bit. And it kind of took off. So Goatober is not my idea. It started in the United States um, 10 years ago this year by a woman called Erin Fairbanks. And she was working for a company called Heritage Foods. Heritage Foods are like the last bastion of well-reared, well-looked-after ethical meat in the whole of the United States, more or less. I mean, and they, they work with farmers across, across the US, particularly yeah. in the Midwest. They've got a, quite a, a famous turkey farmer called Frank Reese, who's the only person left producing naturally reared turkeys in the whole of the United States. So that gives you an idea of what they're like. They're an ethical, free-range, non-antibiotic um, meat seller. Um, uh, and they're based in Brooklyn. And Heritage Foods is run by Patrick Martins. His wife runs, uh, Anne Saxelby, runs the best cheese shop in the whole of New York. So she was working with these cheese producers up in the north, up in the northern states of the US, up through Wisconsin, and uh, around Maine and um, Vermont, where a lot of that sort of farmhouse cheeses are made. And Anne Saxelby came across this problem with the billy goats, that yeah. if, you ha if you have a herd that is producing liquid milk, goat dairy, this in the simplest terms, in order to produce lactation, you require pregnancy. Pregnancy has a very definite outcome, yeah. and nature, de most goats will have two kids, and nature, de nature decrees that it's 50-50 split between boys and girls. What happens to all those boys? And in conversations with the farmers, the farmers were saying, we really want to find a market for these. It's the worst part of our job having to destroy them. Yeah. In any dairy system in the world, more or less, where there are male but dairy billies, yeah. nobody wants to eat them, so they're euthanized. Um, so Erin had the idea of using her contacts through Brooklyn and Manhattan, through the Brooklyn and Manhattan restaurant world, um, to try and help out these farmers and sell their male goats. And that became Goatober. So about five years ago, I got in contact with Erin and Heritage Food and said, would you mind if I stole your idea? Because I think it kind of grabs the imagination. It's a really good idea and it's a really silly name. It's a, real, it's a really easy way to convey there is this problem in the UK dairy system and it needs to be fixed. And this is a tool to help fix it. Yeah, we did our first event of the jugged hair in about well, four years ago. And now, well, this year obviously is very different. Um, but last year we had events all over Europe, uh, in Trinidad, in the United States, all over the United States, um, and in Australia. And it's something that people have picked up because as I said, everywhere there are, there is a dairy industry, there are billy goats that are gonna get euthanized because we don't have, in the West, in sort of in that sort of generic term the west we don't have any cultural history of eating goat and we're we're sort of teaming up with people like alex to show to showcase their products while cooking on it's difficult to have favorites but this is definitely my favorite and the thing about alex's stuff is is the heft of it like it has a weight and a and a definition in the hand that mm. is just lovely. Married to that is like the sort of functional simplicity of it. It's there's really lovely things. Um, and the reason that, I mean, with the neck fillets, you just stick it in, pick it up and turn it. And it, it, that not faffing around with tongs is just really nice. It's also really handy to stick in and then use a knife to carve it. Yeah. And like, I just thought, oh, why haven't I always had one of these? Why has it taken me <laughs> 43 years to own one of these? It just doesn't make any sense. And Alex Absolutely. said that we've got peas to blame for why we don't use these yeah. more often. Yeah. I don't like peas more than I like my barbecue fork. <laughs> why bring back the barbecue fork and ban peas. That's what I say. <laughs> Curry goat is amazing. And it's one of the great world foods that is really famous. But there is much more to goat meat than curry. And one of the things that we hear is every time, oh, what do you do for a living? I run a goat meat company. Oh, I love goat curry. It's like almost like a reflex. Mm. Like everybody's tried goat in this context. Yeah. And what Goatober tries to do is say, there's loads more to it. And part of the reason that there is loads more to it is because sheep farming is very 
not specific to the UK, but it's very popular in the UK. So it pushed, we don't have a lot of goat in the in our farming system. Yeah. Whereas if you go to places throughout the Middle East or North Africa or in South America, goat would be, the word mutton is interchangeable between sheep and goat. So yeah. so a lot of the recipes that we eat, like tagine is a good example, the feta that we cooked at the, that we cooked at the forge the other day, those, those have been anglicized in cookbooks and recipes to use lamb or to use mutton because we haven't had the goat available to put them in to make them authentic. Yeah. And that's basically what Goatopers do. Is they, look, there is so much more to goat meat than this. Than your instant, like, because it's almost like it's peas and carrots, curry yeah. goat, it's yeah. uh, bread and butter, fish yeah. and chips, curry goat. And, and what, and using the platform of Goatober and pulling in other people to sort of celebrate it with us gives us an opportunity to say, oh, I'd never, th like, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this better with it, or I'm going to do yeah. these meatballs with it, or I'm going to do this or that with it. And oh, I'd never thought of using goat for that. Yeah. You know? and that. And that's about just, showing people what it can do. Sometimes you can be a little bit too so boxy and a little bit too not aggressive but just a little bit too be a little bit too forceful a little bit too repetitive mm. and not say actually yes we want you to do this thing but this thing is really nice yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah and that or it's and it's not this thing isn't much more expensive than the things you're already doing or you should feel guilty about the, the way that you're behaving at the moment none of that's in gotoba gotoba is we just want you to eat some really nice food yeah. and try something you've never done before. And yeah. cooking is loads of fun. Yeah. You know, I mean, cooking is fun, it's enjoyable, it is something you get to share with your family and other people. You know, you, the, hopefully you'll cook something for four or for six, not for seven at the moment, unfortunately. <laughs> but, um, you know, and you'll be able to share it with other people and just the convivial nature of dining. I think one of the other things about the feta that I, that I really like is that it shows how easy it is to cook goat. One of the things that, going back to people talking about curry, you think we need these long, slow cooks, we need these really bold flavors. It's quite a complex recipe. And what that dish shows is you cook it like a steak, you slice it up and you throw it in with other ingredients you're already quite familiar with. So it's not, it doesn't take hours of preparation. You don't have to know any special skills. If you can light a barbecue and cook a steak, you can make that dish. And one of the things, as I said, we have tried for years to tell people that goat isn't, particularly it goat doesn't have any special characteristics that make it difficult to cook mm. you know you can cook it just like lamb you cook it just like mutton and the the simplicity in that feta is one of the dish is one of the things that we try to promote when we do these sort of cooking videos but there's lots of there's lots of those kind of pulse broken bread mm. salad-y yogurt-y dishes that come from come from sort of Lebanese Syrian Israeli area that's quite a sort of yeah. that's quite a it's not an unusual mixture uh, normally you I mean you can do it with all kinds of meat as well you could we use the neck fillets for the one that we did but you could quite easily slice leg like grill leg meat into it you could even do it with some chops or you could do it with just dice just fry it off yeah um, and that yeah the, the sort of the reason I like those dishes so much is because they're so it's like putting a bowl of nachos in front of somebody you know everybody dives in everybody has a little bit yeah um, and I also like the idea of piling a big plate of food in the middle and everybody's sharing it because it just those kind of ways of eating just stops and everybody sort of it's much more it breaks a lot of ice mm. like if you're if you're giving a plate of food to share um but yeah the with the with that particular dish i think it's a lot of these things a lot of these dishes designs are made from using stuff up yeah. and essentially that's yesterday's food that feta because you've already cooked the chickpeas for the dinner you had the night before you've got the pita bread left over from the night before the meat you could use like if you roasted a leg you could put cold meat into that as well it's kind of like a almost like a Lebanese hash I guess mm. like reusing stuff from the from the time before yeah. and then putting the the yogurt into it to give it a bit of sweetness and a little bit of moisture um, and then I mean the other thing the thing we didn't put in it was like the Aleppo chili, put a little bit of Aleppo chili through it, or you could put fermented chilies through it, and then loads of coriander for a load of lift. But the and also loads of lemon juice, so you get. And so it's kind of a it, the meat sort of makes it a warm salad, but with the with the addition of the herbs and the lemon juice and the yogurt, it kind of lifts it beyond the sum of its parts. Yeah.
Alex and his team are quite local to us, so being able to support him is, is a good thing because it's the same as supporting your local business. But I think it comes down, like I, I keep returning to the heft of the product in the hand and that, that there's a, an authenticity to it that you just don't get with stuff that's smashed out on a laser cutter. Mm-hmm. And that, I think it's a, it's a strange thing, but that when you're preparing the whole, like we, I cook a lot for a lot of people at home, like I have people around all the time and to be able to use these things as part of the sharing experience almost gives a, a sort of a, a, a depth and authenticity to the entire experience.